sometimes it, it just seems like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. But you know what I know is that somebody needs to hear it that day. And if it feels like sometimes that you're coming to church and you're hearing the same thing over and over again, it's probably because God's trying to get your attention. It was probably the most important question that has ever been asked. And I think that he knew all along the place and the time that he was going to ask that question. You see, they were about 25 miles north of Galilee, and they were walking along, and they were going to this place that was known as the City of Gods. And as they're walking along, you've got to imagine what it looked like. There were temples along the road. Until he came up to this one place which had this huge cave, and out of the cave, mouth of the cave, water flowed through that fed into the Jordan. And this water that fed into the Jordan was crystal clear, and it came out of the cave. And rumor had it there was no end to that cave. It was a spiritual place for a number of reasons. You see, in the side of the mountain, they had carved off niches, if you will, and then they would put their idols in those niches. So no matter who you were, you could come and worship there. As a matter of fact, stories were told that the god Pan came from there. And I don't know if you know who Pan is, but Pan was a god of the Greeks, and he was half man and half goat. And if you can remember the pictures of him, of a man, half man, half goat, playing a little flute, that's the god Pan. And it was in this place that people came from all over to worship their gods. And it was in the Jordan River a lot of the Israelites told the story of their salvation from the Egyptians. And so as they're walking along and they're seeing all this, and I don't know exactly where he was, but I have in the picture of my mind that he hadn't gotten there yet, but he could see the crowds of people that were there to worship, to pay respects to the different gods. He was halfway through his time with these disciples. And he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? Once again, he's talking about himself in third person. But by this time, the disciples have gotten used to him talking about himself in the, the idea of the Son of Man. And they replied, and I can see the disciples saying, Oh, well, I, I've heard some of them say that you're John the Baptist, and I've, I've heard some say that you're Elijah. And then another one would perk up after a minute and say, well, some say that you're Jeremiah. And then somebody, oh, I heard he was also another prophet. And it's then that he stops. And he asks, but what do you? What about you? Who do you say I am? The most important question. And as this scene plays out in my mind, and of course I wasn't there, I don't know, but it's, as this scene plays out in my mind and his disciples around him, it gets quiet. Because they all want to say that who he is, but they're scared to. Because it might not be true, but even more than that, it might be true. And this scene plays out in my mind that they're all looking around and some of them are looking down and then all of a sudden they look over and they see Peter. Peter's always got an answer, right? And so maybe about five or six of them start to look to Peter like, Peter, you got to say something, it's time. And Peter blurts out, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He was not saying Peter was who he's building the church on. He was saying on the confession that Jesus is the Son of God is what the church is going to be built on. The church is built on no man. It's built on Jesus Christ. But he says at that moment, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And I need you to understand Peter's mindset here because these people had been reading apocalyptic literature and there was a Messiah coming. And it was very similar to our Superman of today. He was going to come in and he was going to save the Israelites from the Roman occupation. He was going to come in and take over and establish a kingdom that would last forever. And Peter says... You are the Messiah. And almost as if to say, Jesus is going to tear his robes off and he's going to have a big M on the front of it. But he doesn't. He says, I'm going to build my church. He says, I tell you that you are Peter and On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. It wasn't his time. If you got your lesson notes and you want to look at your lesson notes, I want you to look down at Matthew chapter 16, the continuation of this story. After he tells them not to tell anybody that he is the Messiah, he then says to them, from that, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of law, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, this is not a good plan, Jesus. We don't want a Savior that dies. We want a Savior that is king, that is ruler, that will take some vengeance over what we've been through for all of these years. You see, it didn't sound like a good plan. And when I read this from time to time, I think, Peter, what are you doing? You're trying to talk Jesus out of our salvation. But then I think about the times I've tried to talk Jesus out of things. You see, I call it prayer. When something's burdening me and I'm going through a difficult situation or a difficult time or somebody I love and I say, Jesus, this is not a good plan. Let me tell you what it is that you need to do here. And I'm no different than Peter. And here's the thing that I want you to see that he says to Peter next. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. If you take your pen and underline those things, merely human concerns, because that is what we mostly do whenever we pray for somebody we mostly pray for human concerns when's the last time we got down and we prayed for somebody because of the spiritual battle they were having when's the last time we prayed for anybody over those kinds of things because we have mostly human concerns not spiritual concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciple, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is not my idea of fun Christianity. Is it yours? What do you mean I have to take up my cross? Do you realize that if I have to take up my cross like Jesus took up his cross, do you realize that means I've got to let other people lead me? 
Do you realize that I've got to lose myself? I have to de deny myself, my rights, all of those things? <laughs> you know, when I signed up for Christianity, I signed up for it as a young kid. And if I did what was right, I got what was good. And Jesus, I saw you feed the 5,000. I saw you heal the people. This is the good that I want. I don't want to take up no cross. Be honest with me. Have you ever prayed, God, let me suffer some for you today? We don't pray that. But Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come into his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And 30 years later, Peter writes the book of 1 Peter. And the guy that said Jesus shouldn't suffer, the guy that rebuked Jesus, the guy that was, said, that was said of him, get behind me, Satan. And I can just imagine the other 11 when Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Them whispering, I knew all along he was Satan. Because that's what we do, isn't it? And 30 years later, he writes these words to a church that's scattered all over. And he says, dear friends, I love that. Dear friends. You know what that was Peter's way of doing? He was saying to those folks, have I told you lately that I love you? Dear friends, and underline these words. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has yet come on you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. I, I know from time to time we have difficulties here. I, I remember one time when we came to the church building here and there was no air conditioning and, and it was hot. That was my fiery ordeal. I, I can't wait to get to heaven and tell everybody about it until the guy comes up and says, well, you know, I had a fiery ordeal in that I was burned at the stake for my belief. You see, there was this one time I was trying to get to church on Wednesday night and the traffic was really bad and I was tired and I almost didn't make it on time and I hate coming in late and, you know, I'm suffering. Until somebody comes up and said, you know, I had to uproot my family. I had to take everything that I own and sell it. And I had to move to a new location and live as a stranger. Do not be surprised. Underline do not be surprised. And then the next thing I want you to underline, but rejoice. Inasmuch as you have participated in the suffering Christ so that you may be, and underline this word, overjoyed. Re but rejoice, underline that, overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Underline the word bless. For the spirit of glory in God and of God rests on you. If you should suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler, underline a meddler. I, I love this. He's writing to these Christians. He's writing to us today. He says, you know, if you're going to suffer, don't suffer as a murderer. And we all go, amen. Shouldn't murder people. And he says, if you're going to suffer, don't suffer as a criminal. Oh, amen. We don't want any criminals in here. But then he says, he slaps them in the face. And don't suffer as a meddler. Do you know what a meddler is? Another term for it is, is a busybody. Another term for it is, is getting into other people's business where you don't belong. 
And I'm going to tell you, the biggest problem in the church when people are coming to church is not people who are criminals and not people who are murderers. We have some people who have been criminals. We have some people who have done some wrong things. But the biggest problem we have in the church is the people that want to meddle and gossip. That's the biggest problem in the church. You see, we, we have a sanctified way of gossiping. We're real, we're real Christian about it. You know, Neil, I need to talk to you about this because I'm really concerned. I'm real concerned for Linda Vines. We're going to just use Linda tonight. <laughs> I'm real concerned for Linda. You, have you seen the way she walks in here and she acts like she owns the place? Well, she does own the place. You all know that, right? But my point being, somebody will come to me and they'll do it out of concern. And one of the things that I always ask, have you talked to God about it first before you talk to me? And a lot of times we will use this sanctified way of looking at the world like I'm concerned or I've been praying for or, or I, I see this in such and such a life. And, and all we're doing is meddling. And I am so, so very thankful for this church that that doesn't go on, at least around me, very much. Because that is one of the quickest ways to destroy a church is when people start backbiting, start getting in other people's business where they don't belong, and start judging others. Have you ever, you don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever heard a sermon and thought, I wish such and such was here to hear that? You all have. I can tell by the grins on your face. You know who God put there to hear it? You. He says, even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God. Underline those words. That you bear that name, for it is... It is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should, underline, commit themselves to their faithful creator and to continue to do good. 30 years later, Paul or Peter comes along and says, if you're going to suffer, make sure you suffer for the right reasons. We have been in the book of 1 Peter for 11 months. And in this 11 months, this is the fourth lesson I have done on suffering. And I have to tell you, I almost think I've said everything I know about suffering. And there's times when I'm preaching or when I'm teaching, I, it, it happened when I've been going through the minor prophets, sometimes it just feels like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And, and my nephew David is a preacher, he hasn't been preaching as long as I have, but I can guarantee you there's times he thinks, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. But even more important, David has three sons. Now, he's got a daughter that is an angel, but he's got three boys that are all boys. And he has to tell them the same thing over and over again. You know how I know? Because I raised two of them. And I told them over and over again the same thing. But I got to tell you, sometimes it, it just seems like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. But you know what I know is that somebody needs to hear it that day. And if it feels like sometimes that you're coming to church and you're hearing the same thing over and over again, it's probably because God's trying to get your attention. Because I remember when I was raising my kids, I had sayings that I made them repeat after me. And the one they hate the most that they still can quote 
just like that, is when they had schoolwork to do and they didn't want to do it, and I could say, hey, boys, you can play now and pay later. Or you can pay now and play later. But if you play now and pay later, that price is always greater. And they hated that because I didn't have to say any more after that. They just had to go do their work. But to this day, they remember it. And when things come along and they want to put it off, I guarantee you in the back of their mind, they hear their dad's voice. And when things come along that you've heard in the church year after year, it's because your dad's voice is trying to get your attention. I really don't believe that I have suffered enough for the cause of Christ, and I am not, I am not praying for suffering. But when you look at this passage of Scripture right here, and you look at those words, you look at, don't be surprised, but rejoice. Be overjoyed. You're blessed. And you can praise God in all of that. You think to yourself, have, have we adopted a thing of Christianity, a, a mindset of Christianity that it should be easy? And I think we have. I think we have. I know I got asked to do something today, and I'm not going to tell you the details on it, but it was something I was asked to do that I really don't want to do. But, but it, it's, I went, and I, I'm talking to Nancy about it, and I said, look, I really don't want to do this, but I really feel like I've got to. And she heard what I had to do, and then she said, well, I tell you what, if you end up doing it, I will, I will go with you to do it. And I'm like, oh. I wanted you to say, yeah, you don't need to be doing that. But no, I'll go with you. Thanks a lot, Nancy. I know she's watching. But anyway, the point, thing, the point I'm trying to make here is that we don't suffer for Christ, and maybe we ought to look to suffer for Christ. Well, there's four reasons that I've come up with, that, I, and there's probably a, a lot more. Uh, as a matter of fact, when uh, David uh, comes back over here on a Wednesday night, I'll let him do a whole series on why we suffer, okay? Because he knows, he knows about suffering. Uh, he's had me for an uncle for several years, so he knows about suffering. But anyway, these are the four things. The first one is God. The first reason why we suffer is God. And I know sometimes that God puts us in places that we don't want to be, and, and we're suffering. And it may not be physically suffering, but it may be emotionally suffering. It may be a hardship that we're going through. And I know of some hardships that I've gone through that I'm on the other side of now, and they don't seem like they're that bad. But at the time I was going through it, it felt like it was awful. And I was asking God, why me? Anybody ever ask God, why me? And I, I was asking God, why do I have to go through this? And, and I, I had this conversation with God I'll never forget. I said, God, don't you understand who I am? I, I am a deacon at the church. I preach occasionally. I am working for you all the time. Why do you want me to go through this? And I, it wasn't a prayer like that. It was a prayer of sobbing. I mean literally crying my eyes out for two days because I was totally blown away by what happened. Look what Hebrews says. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as, as discipline. God is treating you as children, for what children are not disciplined by their father. Tyler had just turned 23. 
and he called me. Now, you got to understand, I have a relationship with my boys now that was different from five years ago and so on. But at 23, Tyler was still trying to find himself in a lot of ways. And we talked occasionally, but it was generally me calling him, not him calling me. So when he called me, and I remember it was just right after his birthday. And he called me, and we began talking, and I asked him how his day was going, you know, all the little general chit-chat. And, and then he said, Dad, there's something I need to tell you. I said, what? He says, as a teenager, I hated your guts. And I said, okay. <laughs> you know, just go ahead and punch me in the gut. And I said, how do you feel about me now? He said, let me finish, Dad. He said, I hated your guts because you didn't let us live like everybody else. He says, I hated your guts because you made us pay for our own gas in the car. You made us pay for insurance. You made us pay for a cell phone. And if we wanted money to do something, you made us earn it. And all of my friends got their car paid for, they got their gas paid for, they got their insurance paid for, and if they needed money, they just asked their mom and dad, and I had to earn it. And I hated your guts. He said, Dad, I'm 23 now, and all of my friends are still 16 because their parents never made them do anything. And I am so thankful that you made me do what you made me do. And it went from a gut punch to a big pat on the back. <laughs> but I can just imagine how God feels sometimes when we're mad at him because we're suffering. When we're mad at him because of the fact that things are not going our way. The second reason why we suffer is we live in a broken world and your page says first peter chapter 6 verses 10 through 11 i dare anybody to read that passage because it's not in your bible that's supposed to be ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 and it says finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of god so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes now, I want you to understand something. If you're going to go after the Father and you can't get to the Father, who do you go after next? His kids. And the devil can't get to the Father. So who is he going after? Us. The people that I appreciated the most in my uh, time when my kids were we're young and even now are the people that have taken my kids and taken care of them and the people that I wanted to hurt the most are the people that mistreated my kids and to this day our family bond is so good that if something happens to Matt I'm going to have to hold Tyler back and if something happens to Tyler, I'm going to have to hold Matt back because they're brothers. And when anything's happening to each, each of them, they are, are with each other. I got so tickled over the fact that Tyler said, Dad, did you hear about Matt's cat? And his cat's name is Boo. And I said, no, I didn't hear about Matt's cat. He said, he called me last night because Boo was missing and asked me to pray for him. And I said, well, did you? He said, well, of course I did, Dad. But he said, the cat had only been gone for a few hours. And I said, did the cat come back? He said, I think so. <laughs> but you know what? When one of my boys hurt, I hurt. I'm only as happy as my saddest child. And if that's true for me, an earthly father, who is flawed in so many ways, what do you think's going on in heaven when we're hurting but we're in a broken world and the devil is after us and he's going to find ways to hurt God's kids the third thing is sin and its consequences 
And that's not just my sin, it's other people's sins. You see, sin and its consequences, that's the reason why we suffer. And and a lot of times, don't think you're suffering for Christ because you're a criminal or because you're a murderer or because you're a meddler. You suffer for Christ for doing what's good. But sometimes you suffer because of your sin and its consequences. And when you suffer because of the consequences of somebody else's sin, it's just as difficult as the consequences of your own sin. Whenever I talk to a parent and they have a child that is in sin, That sin that the child is in has consequences, but the consequences are also with the parent because the parent's heart is broken. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've cried with parents over what their kids have done, not what they have done. And the fourth reason I think we suffer is, and you can write my name in there, Neil Farr, Or you can just put what I put in my notes, which is dumb decisions. I think if you looked up dumb decisions in the dictionary, you would see my picture. That's the reason why I said you could put my name in there. I have made a lot of dumb decisions in my lifetime. It wasn't that I was being malicious. It wasn't that I was trying to do something that was wrong, but I just made some dumb decisions. Anybody in here besides me ever make a dumb decision? All right, at least some of you will admit to it. Those of you who did not admit to it, you just made a dumb decision. (laughs) So, four truths about suffering. Suffering may not mean God has let us down, but that he is building us up. Suffering may not mean that God has let us down, but that he is building us up. And the reason why I want you to see that is because if it, I, that time that I was telling you about, that I was bargaining with God, that I was crying my eyes out for two days, I cried every moment I was awake because I could not believe what was happening to me, and I felt the burden of the world on me for those two days. But what I realize now looking back on it is God put me through that so that I could be ready for this. And every time I have suffered in my life, you've heard the phrase from somebody, no pain, no gain. Every time I have suffered, it's because God's getting me ready for what's next. And sometimes when we're in the middle of suffering, it's because God is getting you ready for what's next. Number two, our surprise of suffering shows our wrong expectations. Our our surprise of suffering shows our wrong expectations. We should expect to suffer as Christians. Now, I am so thankful for most of us, we do not suffer. But we should expect to suffer sometimes as a Christian. Number three, suffering will show what we really believe, show if we really believe what we believe. Suffering will show if we really believe what we believe. You see, when you're suffering, you either turn towards God or you turn away from God. There was a time in my, one of my son's lives where I knew he was not doing what was right. I mean, I absolutely knew it. And the reason why I knew he wasn't doing what was right is because our relationship He didn't want to be around me anymore. And sometimes when we suffer, it shows where the what what we really believe. Because if I'm suffering and I'm turning towards God, or I'm suffering and I'm turning away from God. Number four, our suffering may be someone's greatest blessing. Our suffering may be someone's greatest blessing. There was a young boy, and uh, it was a Sunday night. I hated Sunday night services to traditional Sunday night services where somebody preached, and you know, we just it just I didn't like it. It was felt like a repeat of Sunday morning. I was even talking to David about that, and David does a Sunday evening uh, sermon, and it's more of a Bible class, a discussion where he asks questions, and they 
answer and so forth. And I appreciate that so much because I, I, I felt like there needed to be something else on Sunday night. So I, before small groups, I tried this thing called Sunday Night Live. And we, because Sunday nights are kind of like Wednesday nights where you don't have that many people, I turn all the chairs so we were in a big circle. And there was about 100 of us in the room. And there was a, that night I had gotten two guys and I said, I want you to talk about how you've seen God work in your life. And I thought these two guys would start the discussion. So I had plants in there. You ever do that, David? Put a plant in there? Yeah, somebody has the answer. And so I had those plants in there and I was all ready and I started saying, all right, now let's talk about where we have seen God work in our lives. And this one guy stood up and he said something about his job and so forth. I don't really remember what he said, but then this nine-year-old boy stood up. And his nine-year-old boy had lost his mother to a heart attack. And he stood up and he said, I didn't want for my mom to die. But this nine-year-old boy said, because my mom died... And he listed off 12 people that had become Christians. He knew that the suffering he was going through was the greatest blessing for someone else. I have a headlamp I wear sometimes. If I'm working underneath the cabinets or in a, in a dark space I put it on my head and I turn it on makes me feel important <laughs> but do you know when that light shines the brightest in the dark and when we're suffering that's when our light shines the brightest. One last thing, and then I'll turn it up, turn it over for comments, criticisms, or whatever you want to do. One thing to remember, bring glory to God in suffering, not for suffering. Bring glory to God in suffering, not for suffering. And when it comes to bringing glory to God, that just means make God look good. Okay? Because a lot of times we get these church words and we don't really understand what it means. But we're just trying to make God look good in our suffering, not because we are suffering. Comments, questions, criticisms. Got one down here. John Love wants to be critical. <laughs> Always. When we suffer, we arrive at the place where Job arrived after all of his suffering. When he said to God, I used to know thee by the hearing of the ear, but now I see. Ah, nice, very good point, very good point. Anybody else? Man, that was a good class if I shut all of you up. Oh, we got one over here. Pass it, pass it over here to Brother Chris and let him uh, expound. This is not exactly about suffering, but uh, back on Matthew 16, 21 through 27, it says, For the Son of Man is going to come in the Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. What's the reward for what we have done? What's the reward? David, I'm so glad you're here tonight. No. <laughs> no, the reward for what we have done is we're laying up treasures in heaven. You know, there's a lot of times where I do things and there's no satisfaction here on earth. But I often say there will be a reward in heaven. And there is different degrees of heaven as far as where we will serve and what we'll do. We're not going to all get in and be equal. It is not children's soccer where we all get a participation trophy. We are going to be rewarded for what we have done. And I guess my, the only reason I like to bring it up when I see that is, is that's inconsistent with a lot of modern Christian um, mindset. Don't worry about it. The work's already been done. You know, uh, the work hasn't been done. Uh, the, the work that we couldn't do has already been done, giving us that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But everywhere it talks about judgment, it talks about 
you getting rewarded for your works. And, and so it's not true that, that we're not, you know, we're in like Flint. You know, we get baptized and we're done. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And I love the passage in Ephesians where it talks about the fact that God has prepared in advance works for us to do. Okay? Every day you get up, God has prepared work in advance for you to do. Now here's the question. Do we recognize the work he's prepared for us to do? Are we looking for the work that he's prepared for us to do? Richard? Well, that, that kind of goes with, with what I was already thinking is that, you know, in, in societal relationships, we tend to migrate to things that make us comfortable. Amen. And we migrate away from things that make us uncomfortable. Uncomfortable is a form of suffering, albeit a mild form, but it's a mild form of suffering. Mm -hmm. But we look for the things that, that we like to do, we feel like doing, and we justify it by acting like it's what we're supposed to be doing. The, the parable of the Good Samaritan is the perfect example that God put before those men something that they wanted, that he wanted them to do. And instead they crossed over to the other side of the street because they wanted to go do what the, they thought was more comfortable. And there's, you know, several parables of Jesus that kind of illustrate that same point, you know, where Jesus called them and he said, no, I've got other things, I've, got, I've, I've married a bride and I've got to go take care of her, I've done this, I've got, you know, we, we do the things that we're comfortable with. Uh, you talked about, about how we think that, you know, serving God is supposed to be easy. It couldn't be easier than, than what we have it in this society. Mm -hmm. We have these comfortable chairs, air conditioned. You know, we don't have to be around people that make us uncomfortable and that are bleeding to death on the side of the road, you know. And we put ourselves in situations for the most part where we avoid the suffering. Amen. You know? But by doing that, to answer your question, are we avoiding what God has laid out for us to do? I wonder if there's going to be a place in heaven where God shows us the opportunities that we had that we missed because that would be horrible to look watch. Yes, Kat. You were talking about building up, laying up treasures in heaven. Here on this earth, in this country, we lay up treasures here on earth so we could retire. But for a Christian, our soul does not retire until we get to heaven. Amen. So spiritual retirement doesn't happen when you're 80 or 90. Yeah. It happens when you leave here. Amen, amen. And I, I asked Brent if I could tell this story when I was preaching away, but I'm going to just tell it now. I went to Brent's retirement party, and we had a good time and all, but the thing that just impressed me so much is he was talking about retiring and his career and all those things. But then at the end of it, well, actually all through it, he says, if you need me, I'm here. If you need me, I'm here. I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to do that. He was retiring from being a pilot, but he was not retiring from being a Christian. Thank you, Brett. Anybody else? Great. Let's go to God in prayer real quick and be dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word that guides our footsteps, that gives us